Continuing on with chapter 19, Sticky Notes, this is page 526. So you need to know this caption and picture on the different types of coal. And so when you have an ancient forest that um, the trees fall down, the plant matter, etc., and it gets buried through erosion and deposition, over time it gets buried and then you have heat and pressure under the ground. And so when you have a little bit of heat and pressure, you get something called peat. And then more heat and pressure, you get lignus, subbituminous, bituminous, and anthracite coal. So you need to know actually all of these things. Um, you can skip subbituminous, but you need to know peat, lignite, bituminous, and anthracite coal. So peat is a precursor to coal. It's partially decayed vegetation uh, placed under high pressure anaerobic conditions. Oh, anaerobic and acidic. I forgot the word acidic. So anaerobic and acidic conditions give you peat. Um, if you read books that are set in Great Britain, uh, oftentimes you may read that they um, are burning peat because it is a highly efficient energy source. It's not as good as coal, but a lot of people in Great Britain, you know, 100, 200 years ago, they would just go out and dig up some peat in the ground and bring it home and use it to heat their houses and to cook with. So um, a lot of that's been depleted, but there still is a lot of peat fields um, out in Great Britain. Uh, they have more efficient ways to heat and cook now in Great Britain. So this is kind of um, one that you'll see in older literature, British literature. The best type of coal is anthracite um, because it has the most energy per volume. So it's the most uh, most heat and pressure has condensed um, all of that carbon together. Um, so it makes it almost pure carbon. It has the least air pollution. So this is the cleanest burning. So it's the better burning coal, but we don't have that much of it. Um, the most that we have, most of our coal in the United States is bituminous, um, which is actually bad for sulfur dioxide, but we have it. It's common, um, but it's not great for air pollution. Anthracite's better. And we have anthracite in, in the United States too, but not as much as bituminous. So uh, one thing you need to know um, is that coal deposits are found below peat, but above igneous rock. So you don't see this in this picture, but you have peat up here and then coals under the peat. So you have coal down here and then it actually is above igneous rock, um, but it's sedimentary. So you need to know coal is sedimentary rock um, and it's below peat and it's above igneous. I know it's like a lot of weird factoids to learn, but it's it's part of geology that's that's important. All right, on the next page we have 527. So know that oil sand, or I'm sorry, oil shale. So this is different than tar sand. So tar sand is bitumen, oil shale is kerogen. Um, you also need to know that methane hydrate um, is on here as well. And so it's another source of um, methane. So if we run out of easier sources of natural gas, which is methane, then there's also some that are in ice as well. That doesn't mean like it's great environmentally to extract this, but it's there as a reserve. We also have a lot of oil stuck in shale, which is in the form of kerogen. We have some in California, north by Bakersfield in a um, place called Taft. There's a lot of oil shale. The problem getting this shale out is it requires fracking, which uses a lot of water, and there's not a lot of water up there. So we don't, in California, we just don't have tons of water to use for our daily needs and growing food, much less to crack rock to get kerogen out of. So right now, it's too costly. Our net energy benefit is too expensive. We would spend more getting the kerogen out of the shale than the price of shale, than the price of it is. So people would lose money if they got it out right now. Um, you need to know oil sands up here. Just, you don't have to memorize every step in, ref in how it's gone out, but you need to review um, a little bit about it and that it's strip mining, which we'll learn more about mining in chapter 23. And um, that there's a huge amount of habitat loss 
And so this is the information. Um, read through and review it a little bit before your test and before the AP test. All right, page 528. All right. So 528, we have crude oil distillation. And so there's a lot of things, and that's a picture of a um, refinery with the distillation col uh, columns. We actually actually used to have an oil refinery in Santa Clarita. It was off the 14 freeway kind of by the cemetery. Um, you can still see where it was. It's now considered a hazardous waste site. But um, when I was a kid, they still refined oil there. But anyway, by boiling point, you can refine it into different products. So we're most um, familiar with gasoline. Um, but you can make diesel, kerosene, butane, fuel oil, all of that stuff from um, using it at different uh, boiling points. So here's how electricity is generated. Let me pop my book up a little better here so it doesn't fall. And let me get it in view. Here we go. Electricity is generated like this. First, the fuel, like coal or oil or natural gas or even trash, we burn trash, we'll learn that in Chapter 22, is burned and then the heat causes water to boil this and then the steam from the boiling water is forced through pipes which create pressure to spin turbine which causes electrons to move in generators the electrons are electricity and it's sent to the public through wires so you might want to pause this for a second while you catch up your writing but i'm going to go on and look at the picture over here so over here is a picture of it um, you have coal coming in. Coal provides 40% of our electricity so it's in the United States, so it's still a big deal. It's going to grind it up into littler pieces because it burns more efficiently when it's in little pieces. So it's going to be pulverized and then it's going to be lit on fire. And they put water in here and it turns into steam. And then that steam comes along and spins a turbine, kind of like a pinwheel. Um, and then it releases electrons in the generator, which goes to houses. So once the um, water's been heated, it spins turbines, then it comes over here to cool. So a lot of times kids and people think that this type of cooling tower is like only for nuclear power plants, like on the Simpsons. It's, yes, nuclear power plants cool water in this too, but so do other types of power plants. So it's not, this type of thing is just a cooling tower for any type of power plant. All right, and then you have your smokestacks. So to get rid of the air pollution from coal smokestacks, we have wet scrubbers for sulfur dioxide. We have electrostatic precipitators for particulate matter and bag house for particulate matter. And then we have to get rid of ash disposal, which is a problem too, because this is a toxic um, product that comes out of burning coal. You need to know the top two producers and consumers of oil, coal, and natural gas. Um, these numbers change. I don't believe the AP test used to ask this a lot. I have not seen this in like the past decade. So I'm actually going to take this away. So you need to know that there's a few countries though that lead the world in consumption and stuff. So China and the US um, lead the world in coal. Um, in oil, we lead the world in consumption. Saudi Arabia and Russia lead it in production, but sometimes this changes too. So year by year, these numbers can change. Russia's up here with natural gas. So the United States and Russia are very common um, countries that use and produce a lot of natural gas. So because these who leads the world changes year by year, and this book was, this statistic is 2012, those countries can change. Um, which is why they don't really ask that very much in on the AP test. They may ask you like who's a leader in the world in coal and you would want to know the US and China are leaders. Which one should you pick? Well, on the multiple choice question, they will not have China and the US as A, B, C, D. They would have China and then some other countries that really don't have very much coal anyway. So they're not going to have two countries on there that kind of flip-flop first place and you're like, I don't know um, which one this year. They're not going to do that to you. It'll be an obvious answer. So you need to know for coal, it's China and the U.S. For oil, it's the U.S. consuming it. China's catching up. 
producing it is Saudi Arabia, Russia. We actually produce still oil a lot in Alaska. And then down here in natural gas, the leaders are the U.S. and Russia in consumption and production. And we'll go over that some more in a chart as well. All right, so next, page 530, how do we find fossil fuels? So geologists do this. It's a decent job to go into geology. Uh, you know, I don't like to support fossil fuel industry, but we still need fossil fuels until we transition to renewables. But also, geologists help with renewable resources as well. Okay, so how do we find fossil fuels? We drill rock cores, we do seismic surveys, and, and you just need to know these two things. This is how we find deposits underground. All right, um, there is something called ANMOR, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So this is a very controversial area. Um, most of this is preserved as wilderness. Something called a 1002 area can be open to drilling if Congress votes. Every couple of years, it's brought to a vote in Congress um, whether to allow drilling up in the Arctic or not. So let's take a look in the map, 531. So we already drill a lot for oil in Alaska. So up here, we are drilling in the purple and the orange. We are already drilling a ton of oil. And because this is normally frozen up here, um, oil tankers can't come to the top here to get the oil. So there's called the Alaska pipeline that takes the oil all the way down through Alaska and then they pick it up down here where it's not frozen in the port of Valdez. This is the preserved area right here that's supposed to be not drilled to protect wildlife. And so people who want it opened say it provides jobs and money, it um, reduces reliance on foreign oil like from the Middle East. People who oppose the drilling say it's extremely important habitat for um, a lot of migrating species and caribou in particular. The Gwich'in tribe is a tribe of Inuit that rely on caribou and so they're heavily opposed to drilling up there. If we opened this up it would only in a few years, so we'd have to build the infrastructure and the pipes and, and the, the, sorry, the pumps. Um, it would only reduce our gas by one to two cents a gallon. Um, so it isn't going to, for you and I, is not going to be a big cost savings um, if they do open it up for drilling. And so that's the Alaskan uh, Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, okay. So on page 532, you need to know that petroleum is used in so many things in our house. And so take a minute to read through all of these things. And you need to know for your test and the AP test, there is a few specifics they want you to know. Petroleum first, we know this, it makes gasoline. So petroleum is also known as, well, petroleum includes crude oil and bitumen and carrageen and it makes gasoline and other fuels so we know that and the majority of the petroleum makes this because we have a lot of cars in the world to drive it also makes your plastics your polystyrene your styrofoam it makes fabrics so a lot of the fabrics that we wear are made out of petroleum oil a lot of that dry wick fabric for sports is made out of petroleum oil they also make chemicals and pesticides like DDT out of petroleum. They make asphalt. Wax candles are mostly petroleum. You can get soy wax instead or beeswax instead, but the majority of candles that you buy at the store are, are from petroleum. They put it in a lot of our cosmetics as well. I try and get non-petroleum cosmetics as much as I personally can. And so you need to know, again, that petroleum is used in a lot of these products um, because it is on AP questions. And we'll continue with the next video.